So welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for those joining us live online and to those listening afterwards as well. So I'd like to warmly welcome our guests today uh, who I'll be introducing shortly. So our webinar today is entitled Non-Communicable Diseases, Effective Medication Management and Adherence. So we know that non-communicable diseases or NCDs continue to rise and represent a major global health challenge. The digital event, uh, the digital event addresses the importance of proper medication management and adherence in the successful management of long-term NCDs. It will discuss medication management practices and adherence, factors influencing non-adherence in patients with lifestyle-related NCDs, and interventions to promote adherence in low middle-income countries or LMICs. Now, pharmacists play a critical role in optimizing medication treatments, educating patients and implementing interventions to improve adherence, thereby contributing to better health outcomes for NCD patients worldwide. Um, we have a special translation service available in the Thai language this evening. So if our um, participants online would like to listen in the Thai language, please just click on the interpretation bottom at the bottom of your screen and then click on Thai language. Next slide, please. So hello everyone. So my name is Tim Chen. I'm the Professor of Medication Management and Head of Pharmacy Practice at the University of Sydney. I'm also the immediate past president of the social and administrative pharmacy section of um, SAPS, of FIP. Next slide, please. So as you can see, we are joined by an international um, range of uh, panelists this evening uh, from the Netherlands, from Japan, from India, and from Thailand. And in turn, I'll be introducing each of our expert speakers later on in the program. Um, in advance, I'd like to thank them for the time that they've spent in preparing their presentations and their willingness to share their expertise today. So we have a number of housekeeping announcements in relation to this webinar. The first is that this webinar is being recorded and live streamed via YouTube. Uh, the second is that the recording will be available at the FIP website at www.events.fip.org. Um, thirdly, you may ask questions using the question box provided at the uh, bottom of your screen. Um, fourth, you're welcome to provide feedback to webinars at fip.org. And feedback's a very important uh, function of webinars such, uh, such as this, uh, so that there could be improvements in uh, program design and structure. Um, fourthly, if you're not already a member of the FIP, uh, please consider joining FIP at fip.org forward slash membership registration. We know that FIP is a global organization representing 4 million pharmacists and pharmaceutical scientists uh, worldwide. So if you're not already a member of FIP, uh, please consider joining. Um, next slide, please. So this webinar is supported by an unrestricted grant from Viatris. And we thank Viatris for their ongoing support. Um, next slide, please. So for our program today, we have four speakers, as I've already mentioned, from different countries around the world. Our first speaker will be talking about medication management practices for NCDs. Our second speaker from Japan will be talking about factors associated with medication non-adherence among patients with lifestyle-related non-communicable diseases. Our, fourth, our third speaker from India, We'll be talking about interventions to promote medication adherence for NCDs in low middle income countries, with the example being from India. And our final speaker today will be talking about perceptions, attitudes and beliefs of Thai patients in respect of type 2 diabetes towards medication adherence. 
Now, after each of our speakers have uh, given their talks today, uh, this will be followed by a discussion and Q&A uh, dis uh, discussion as well. And then finally, a wrap up uh, before we end in about 90 minutes time. Um, next slide, please. So we have a number of um, specific learning objectives for today. The first is to uh, discuss the importance of effective medication management practices for non-communicable diseases and their impact on patient outcomes. The second is the factors associated with non-adherence among patients with lifestyle-related NCDs and gain insight into the barriers to adherence. Our third learning objective is evidence-based interventions to promote uh, medication adherence, especially tailored for patients in low middle-income countries. And our final learning objective for the webinar today is the critical role of pharmacists in optimizing medication regimens, educating patients and implementing adherence interventions in the context of NCD management. So next slide, please. So we have a number of um, pre-presentation multiple choice questions for our participants online to um, um, answer prior to um, our expert speakers making their presentations. Um, so you can see the poll option online. Please select um, your answer. Once everyone's had an opportunity to answer the first MCQ question, let's go to the next slide, please. So we have our second question here. Which of the following causes unintentional uh, medication ad adherence according to uh, the WHO? So please select your options using the poll function on your screen. And so the, we can see the immediate responses there on the screen, forgetfulness being the highest rating option. Let's go to the next question, please. So our final pre-presentation question um, in relation to, to the WHO framework, it's five dimensions. Four of the dimensions are, uh, are mentioned. What's the fifth dimension of the WHO framework? So again, please use the um, select the option on the poll. Uh, visual on your screen. So we can see that socioeconomic factors uh, were selected by almost 60% of our participants here online. Thank you very much to all of the participants who had a, a, a go at answering those pre-presentation questions. So now it's my very great pleasure to introduce our first expert speaker uh, this evening. Uh, Dr. Vern Boven is a pharmacist and associate professor of cost-effective respiratory drug use at the University Medical Center in Groningen, uh, the Netherlands. Uh, he's the founding director of Medication Adherence Expertise Centre and chair of the European Network to Advance Best Practice and Technology on Medication Adherence, known as the Enable Group. He has published almost 200 peer-reviewed scientific articles and is a very active PhD supervisor as well. So, uh, Professor Van Boven, uh, please... Uh, uh, welcome to give your presentation this evening. Welcome to the virtual podium. Thank you. 
Thank you, Professor Chen, for this kind introduction. And also thank you for all participants from and, and colleagues, uh, pharmacists from all over the world, uh, almost 300 I see. So thank you for attending and for FIP for uh, organizing this, uh, this very relevant webinar for pharmacists, I believe. Um, next slide, please. So the topics I'm going to discuss in the next 15 minutes include uh, the importance of medication management. We will look into the, uh, the role of polypharmacy in NCD patients, looking at the role of pharmacists, looking at patient-centric approaches, and we will also explore briefly the role of digital technologies in medication management, where given my own interest, I will focus with some examples in the respiratory disease area, like asthma and COPD. Next slide, please. So if we look overall across the non-communicable disease area, we'll see that um, medication adherence to chronic medication in this area is consistently suboptimal. Indeed, as you noticed in the poll question, the WHO estimates that around half of our patients, like 50%, um, are non-adherent to their chronic medication. Uh, the OECD, um, estimates that this is related to over 200,000 deaths in Europe alone. And I guess for other continents that will be very similar in, and maybe even higher. Um, it's not only the clinical impact it will have on mortality, it also has economic implications as they estimate that non-adherence has been associated with 120 billion euros of potentially preventable direct healthcare costs related to patients ended up in hospital because of not taking their essential drugs. Next slide, please. So what about the role of polypharmacy? As we know, many patients take more than just one drug and a very nice review of um, and Claxton some years ago showed that the more number of intakes you have per day, the lower your adherence. So even with one drug, it's around 80%. But if you take four drugs, it goes down to almost 50%. And this has been very nicely registered with granular electronic monitoring across uh, disease areas. And it becomes even worse, the adherence, if you have to take these different medicines at different time points during the day. So if there's separate specific time windows that are related, not just taking four pills at one moment. So the more moments of intake, the lower the adherence. Next slide, please. So I said it's not only the clinical implications that will have, but also a very nice systematic review across 79 studies and 14 diseases show that it has severe economic implications, ranging between almost $1,000 up to $50,000, depending on the, the exact area of disease. And as you can see in the graph, there is some variation between different NCDs. Next slide, please. So if you look at the intake itself, it's also important that the, the, the right quality, the right maneuver is being used. And this is especially important for more complex administration routes, such as inhalation drugs that are being used in asthma and COPD, for example. So this is a study in patients with COPD that were monitored with electronic monitoring, not just when they were taking it, so their, their adherence overall, but also the quality of the inhalation technique. And the researchers from Ireland make four groups. As you can see, there's the two green lines below. These are patients with good adherence and good technique, but the red line is patients with poor adherence and poor technique. And you see there's a stepwise increase in the risk of mortality. You see on the y-axis on the left, with up to 40% dying if you're non-adherence, and, and between 10 and 20% if you're properly adherent. So it has a significant impact on mortality in patients with COPD. So it's the intake, but also the quality of the intake that's important. Next slide, please. What else can we do with having more insight in medication adherence and supporting this? I think overall we can make clinical decision making more efficient because the typical thing to do when we face a 
patient with non-adherent with uncontrolled disease, like uncontrolled asthma, or maybe also uncontrolled diabetes, the reflex of most doctors is to increase the dose or add more medicines before looking in the actual reason for non that, that for the reason for this uncontrolled disease. And this very nice algorithm from Imran Salaiman showed that, it, that there's basically four options always you would have. And if you typically say there's uncontrolled disease, the upper left quadrant increasing the dose, that's the typical reflex. However, if you look on the left, if you would know adherence, if the patient is non-adherent and uncontrolled, the first thing you should do is increase adherence. And even, on, on, even better, maybe if patients are properly controlled, if you know the adherence, you might step down or lower the dose and thereby reducing maybe the risk of side effects and cost, of course. Next slide. So on the left, there's 35% of people with uncontrolled asthma that could benefit from adherence improvements. Next slide, uh, next click. And also on the right, you see there's potential if we have fewer drug costs and less risk of side effects, if we can lower the dose, if we know controlled patients can be stepped down. Next slide. So the role of pharmacists in chronic respiratory disease has been very nicely described in the recent FIP report on chronic respiratory diseases, a handbook for pharmacists with um, me being involved and some other uh, worldwide renowned pharmacists in the area of respiratory diseases. It's free to download. I will put it in the chat afterwards. But they nicely state the role of pharmacists in this disease. It includes education on the correct and appropriate medicine administration technique, optimizing medicines use, promoting adherence, addressing and resolving medicine related problems minimizing the occurrence of adverse effects and working together in multidisciplinary care teams. Next slide. And does this work? There's been one of the few and also maybe one of the largest ever randomized controlled trials in of pharmacist care in patients with COPD. This trial was performed in Belgium, in Europe, and they randomized patients to getting proper education on COPD, medicines use and adherence, and the other group received usual care. It took around 38 minutes. That's good to realize. So good education takes time. Um, they included uh, education on pathophysiology, medication management, self-management, and beautifully adherence improved with to almost 90% and inhaler technique also improved. And even better, patients with good education of pharmacists less often ended up in hospital with 35 people in usual care and only nine people being hospitalized in the group with pharmacist uh, care. So it's effective and also cost effective. Next slide. Tackling adherence has many different reasons, and, and I'm sure the next speakers will address this in, in, in further detail. But typically, there's patient-related reasons, such as forgetfulness we talked about. There's treatment-related, such as side effects, polypharmacy, and the society or health system-related factors. And each require a different approach. You can imagine sending reminders or giving reminders to patients that are afraid of side effects is not going to work. So one size fits all clearly is not the way to go. We need to understand the reason behind non-adherence and provide an intervention that's tailored and, and to that patient in front of you in the pharmacy. Next slide, please. So this is one of the ways you could do this in a very practical way that's also described in the FRP handbook. You need a structured questionnaire that you don't forget about reasons, a validated questionnaire. For example, in asthma and COPD, you have the TIE, the test of adherence to inhalers, which is being available for free in over 30 languages, including uh, English, but also Spanish, Portuguese, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, uh, Arabic, many, many languages. I will put it also in the chat if you're interested. One of my PhD students subsequently developed a toolkit in how you can then, based on the answer the patient is given, give, give an, a tailored based intervention. So this, is, uh, this toolkit was developed for asthma and COPD, but we also developed it for diabetes. And I will show you also how that works. And we, we use that in Indonesia. It's one of the PhD students, Sofa Alfian, who did this. Next slide. 
So maybe one of the most emerging options which are now becoming available are digital technologies to support medication management. And the FDA has approved, or this is the American regulator that has approved in only the last five to 10 years, a digital insulin pen, a digital pill and a digital inhaler. And even before that, we had digital pill bottles available that can help. So you see here, there's a needle contain a digital needle container. In my research group, we, we work with a digital spacer for patients with asthma and COPD, helping that can measure not only the intake, but also the quality of the intake, the airflow that's going through if the patient takes the right effort. There are several apps for patients on the smartphone that help them with taking medicines. And also for patients with polypharmacy, there's these kind of calendar packs in the lower right corner you can see. So many, many digital opportunities that are ahead of us and hopefully um, will be implemented soon. Next slide. This is a study we did with the digital spacer. We, we, we got a dashboard for the patient and the healthcare professional, and we did a randomized controlled trial in patients with asthma. And we noticed that the ones that got personalized feedback with the digital spacer got an, a 26% reduction in inhalation errors. And the same we noted in a pre-post study with patients with COPD with 36% reduction. And we validated the digital data also with analysis of human scalp hair, where also, you know, drug can be accumulated and get, be an indicator of non-adherence to drugs. Next slide. So you can use it, as I said, um, affects um, the, the digital data on adherence or adherence in general can be used to guide clinical decision management so in which way we should treat the patient step up step down improve adherence and this strategy has been uh, recently published in the lancet respiratory medicine where this showed that patients with a digital inhaler these were patients with difficult to treat asthma and a digital inhaler could improve adherence with around 10 percent and moreover because they could improve adherence Patients less often needed to step up and get additional treatment with like expensive biologic therapies. So this went from only uh, this went from 21% in control group patients and 11% in patients that get their adherence properly managed. Also, patients required a lower doses of the inhaled corticosteroids, and this was related with cost savings of 3,000 euros per person. Next slide, please. So take-home messages. Adequate medication adherence is essential for effective management of NCDs. Medication adherence is highly prevalent, pre prevalent, at least around 50%, and is associated with both clinical as well as economic outcomes. Pharmacists can play a key role in promoting cost-effective drug use, and for effective interventions, we need to provide a patient-centered strategy. Digital health tools and mobile apps and telemedicine might uh, support patients with proper adherence, um, although this might be uh, implemented in the near future. Next slide, please. If you want to see some more about the studies I showed you, this is a list of references, and I'll make sure in the chat to paste a few of the others I did mention. Next slide, please. And if you want to join the Adherence Network, it's an open network. It's free to join. We provide It's the cost action website. You can see it here below or go to the website of our center, Adherence, enableadherence.eu. Thank you very much for your attention. Next slide, please. Thank you very much, Job, for an excellent data rich presentation and for uh, sharing your um, high level expertise on this. I'd like to remind delegates online that there is an opportunity to post their questions and comments and the Q&A chat. And again, if you'd like to listen to the Thai interpretation, click on the interpretation icon at the bottom of your slide, uh, bottom of your screen, and then click on the Thai language. Um, it's now my very great pleasure to introduce our second speaker this evening or today, Dr. Ri Nakajima, who's a lecturer in pharmacy practice at Nihon University in Japan. Now, her work focuses specifically on pharmacist support to enhance medication adherence. 
Um, she's also very interested in traveling all over the world to see how local culture affects patient thoughts and uh, behavior. Uh, Dr. Nakajima, welcome to the virtual podium. We are looking forward to your presentation today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Chang. I'm very honored to be able to give my presentation, all of you. And today, I'd like to talk about factors associated with medicational adherence among patients with lifestyle-related non-communicable diseases. Next, please. Sorry, next. Ah, thank you. First, I'd like to begin by looking at this figure. I guess most of you already checked this figure. I took this figure from WHO adherence to long-term therapy. Evidence for action, it's published in 2003. And this is a little bit old guideline, but still it can be applied to the current situation of adherence of non-communicable diseases. According to this guideline, there are five interacting dimensions affect medication adherence to long-term therapies. These five interactive dimensions, including health system and healthcare team factors, condition-rated factors, patient-rated factors, therapy-rated factors, and socioeconomic factors. Because of limitation of the presentation time, I can't tell you the details, but you can download um, from the video website. Next, please. In recent years, a dramatic increase in the number of young people with non-communicable diseases has been reported as a result of changes in lifestyle habit in the world. Furthermore, young people with lifestyle-rated NCDs often show poor medication adherence. Younger patients with non-communicable diseases need longer and more consistent medication support to prevent a poorer diagnosis as they are more likely to continue needing medication for longer periods of time, poor adherence among young people with lifestyle-related non-communicable diseases is expected to have a unique association with the factors influencing adherence in this age group. Next, please. And from now, I'd like to introduce our cross-sectional study, which focused on age difference of medication non-adherence among patients with non-communicable diseases. Next, please. Pharmacists can support and have to support patients through their early life to later life. As I mentioned before, Non-communicable diseases are no longer just for the elderly. Life course health support by pharmacists has become important in recent years. But until now, most of the support for adherence for patients with non-communicable diseases has mainly focused on elderly. And there have been insufficient support for patients in adolescents, and middle ages. Next, please. Factors related to medication non-adherence has been identified by various studies and the relationship between socioeconomic factors such as sex, age, race, and educational background and non-adherence is well known. It has also been suggested that the personality and health beliefs of patients influence medication non-adherence. Health locus of control is one of the indicators used to examine the characteristics associated with patient beliefs about health. And it is related not only to non-adherence to medication, but also self-care and lifestyle-rated non-communicable diseases. Previous research has found a strong relationship 
between lifestyle habits such as smoking, drinking alcohol, and the lack of exercise and non-adherence to medication. Furthermore, difficulties directly related to medication intake, such as degree of illness or disability of patients, have also been identified as factors influencing medication non-adherence. Next, please. This study aimed to identify the association between medication non-adherence and its factors in patients with non-communicable diseases by age group. Patients were categorized into two age groups, 20 to 59 years and 60 years or older in this study. Next, please. A cross-sectional study was conducted anonymously using an online questionnaire. Patients were over 20 years adults with non-communicable diseases, shown in this slide, such as hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, and so on. The questionnaire included questions regarding respondent demographic data, such as their age and sex, history of non-communicable diseases, and lifestyle habits, medication non-adherence, patient brief about health, and trouble taking medication. Next, please. In this study, we used a measure of patient unintentional and intentional non-adherence, which has been used before and its variability and validity has been established. Unintentional non-adherence means that the patient unintentionally does not follow the suggestions of a professional, while intentional non-adherence is a deliberate failure to adhere the suggestions of healthcare professionals. Unintentional non-adherence includes patient forget to take medicine, on the other hand, intentional non-adherence sometimes happen when patients doubt about their treatment or fear of side effects. Next, please. Next, please. You. The subscale of unintentional non-adherence consists of four items, and the subscale of intentional non-adherence consists of five items. Each item was rated on five-point Likert type scale, ranging from one to five. Total score on the unintentional non-adherence subscale range from four to twenty, with lower scores indicating high levels of non-adherence. Scores on the intentional non-adherence subscale range from 5 to 25 with lower scores indicating higher levels of non-adherence. Scale items are listed on this table. Next, please. Patient briefs about health measured using the Japanese version of the health glucose of control, uh, HLC scale. HLC refers to people's brief regarding what determines the status of health. The HLC score uh, consists of five subscales with five dimensions each, internal, family, professional, chance, and supernatural. For example, people who have high HLC internal believe that their behavior and efforts determine their health condition. In contrast, people who have HLC chance believe that their luck affects their health condition. Next, please. And each item was rated on six-point Likert type scale ranging from one to six. Examples of scale items are listed on this table. Next, please. So now we moved on the result part. 
a total of 599 NCD patients responded to the, our questionnaire. And here shows an intentional and intentional non-adherence and medication issues by patient characteristics. Uh, Ines, could you click several times, uh, two times? Yeah, thank you. Uh, but both unintentional and intentional non-adherence were seen in patient aged 20 to 59 years than among patient aged over 60 years. Patient aged 20 59 years reported significantly more trouble taking medication than older adults for all items. Next, please. An analysis of the relationship between unintentional and intentional non adherence and types of HLC using Pearson correlation reveals a positive association between the internal subscale and both unintentional and intentional non adherence in all ages. Could you click three times? Oh, thank you. And for young patients, the family subscale was positively correlated with both unintentional and intentional non adherence. And also, professional subscale associated to only intentional non adherence for 20 to 59 years. Next, uh, next slide, please. And this table shows the result of multiple regression analysis of factors related to medication non-adherence. Lifestyle habits and travel taking medication. Among the lifestyle habits of patients aged 20 to 59 years, current smoking was significantly and positively associated with unintentional and non-adherence. Could you click uh, three or four times, Ness? Um, or three times. Oh, thank you. Okay. For this age category, consuming alcohol more than three days a week and current smoking habits were significantly and positively associated with intentional non adherence. And in patient aged 20, to 59 years, there were positive associations of unintentional and intentional non-adherence with some trouble taking medicine. Sometimes I cannot hear what a healthcare professional says, and I found it difficult to organize my medicines. And back to relationship between intentional adherence and lifestyle, Actually, there were interesting findings in young age group. For young age, there were negative association of that eating habit or less exercise and intentional non-adherence. Why this happened? Um, maybe because um, previous studies have shown that patients with diabetes believe meditation therapy is more important than diet and exercise and which may indicate their belief that taking drugs will compensate for an unhealthy diet and lack of exercise, resulting in good medication adherence. Next, please. In conclusion, both intentional and unintentional medication non-adherence were observed among younger patients with lifestyle-related non-communicable diseases. Factors of affecting medication non-adherence by patients with lifestyle-related diseases are uniquely related to their health awareness, lifestyle and medication barriers and differ by age group. Next, please. And future implication of this study is age-dependent, personalized, comprehensive care, including guidance on lifestyle and health-related habits, is necessary to promote medication adherence. Next, please. And that's 
all for my presentation. If you have any questions about my presentation, welcome to email me. And thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Nakajima, for an excellent presentation and for especially sharing your um, insights and views about the use of various tools used to used to uh, measure medication adherence. Um, again, to the participants online, we'll have an opportunity for questions and answers at the conclusion of the fourth speaker this evening. Um, please note, you can add your questions and comments to the Q&A icon at the uh, bottom of your screen. Um, now it's my very great uh, pleasure to introduce our third speaker in the webinar today. Uh, Dr. Surav Basu is a medical doctor trained in community medicine, public health and epidemiology as well. Um, his research involves NCD epidemiology, operational research on NCDs and tuberculosis, primary health care system strengthening, community health promotion, and continuum of care with a focus on medication adherence. Dr. Sarav is Assistant Professor at the Indian Institute of Public Health, uh, Delhi Public Health Foundation of India. And I believe you've just come from your clinic today, so we thank you for sharing uh, your time today and for sharing your expertise. And we're really looking forward to your presentation today. Uh, please, sir, the uh, virtual podium is yours. Thank you very yeah. much. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Timothy. Yeah, thank you. And next slide. Uh, next slide, please. Can I change? Yeah. Um, actually, I think I missed the first slide. Can you go back? Okay. Okay. Okay, so briefly, uh, I'll be discussing about uh, findings from a systematic review which we conducted. And these were, uh, uh, we included the studies, especially the randomized controlled trials uh, to assess uh, improve, uh, is to assess whether community-led interventions or pharmacist-led interventions would improve medication adherence in uh, for NCD-related conditions in LMIC settings. And uh, for this, uh, we restricted our systematic review to studies in India. Uh, India, as you uh, are aware, has the largest population globally. And uh, we also have a very high burden of diabetes, hypertension. Uh, latest estimates suggest that uh, there are almost 36% uh, people in India have hypertension, while almost 11% people in India have diabetes. So we have a very large uh, cohort of patients of diabetes, hypertension, and other NCD conditions. Uh, also, uh, uh, we have a high burden of tuberculosis, so diabetes. So there is a lot of multimorbidity of uh, these chronic conditions in India. And uh, because of the existence of multiple long-term conditions, uh, patient adherence becomes all the more pivotal. Uh, so I'll be briefly talking about, I have structured my talk that in a way that uh, it will first uh, conceptualize some aspects of medication adherence, which are relevant for LMIC settings. And then I'll just briefly speak about, in the second part of my presentation, I'll speak about the findings from my study. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so medication adherence, as we understand, it is the extent to which a person's medication taking behavior uh, corresponds with agreed recommendations from a healthcare provider. This is the standard definition by the World Health Organization. And medication adherence is assumed to have three stages. Uh, the first phase or stage is that of initiation when the prescriber or the doctor prescribes the medication, uh, followed by a phase of implementation. And uh, when the person continues to take the medication, and uh, then uh, this in this implementation stage, our focus is that the patient is taking the medication as per the prescribed dosage, as per the prescribed frequency, and uh, certain other instructions, like whether you consume it with food before or after and followed by the stage of uh, persistence or uh, continuing the medication intake uh, without terminating it. So if 
the absence of cessation of therapy signifies persistence. And because NCDs require usually li a lifetime of therapy, persistence becomes even more important from a uh, medication uh, from the perspective of medication intake. Uh, a challenge in LMIC settings is differentiating, uh, or in low resource settings, is differentiating uh, medication access and medication adherence. Uh, most older literature on medication adherence and uh, the scales which actually emerged from first world countries, they will uh, suggest that adherence is only a behavior. It is. Uh, it has nothing to do with access as such. But uh, current scales, uh, some newer scales that have uh, recently been developed, like the general medication adherence scale by Abbas, that those have a component of uh, finance, uh, financial related non-adherence also, where if the lack of access to medication is also factored as a reason for medication non-adherence. Okay, so I'll come to it later uh, afterwards also in my talk. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, my previous speakers have already uh, spoken in uh, length about the types of uh, medication uh, adherence and uh, non-adherence can be both as, uh, it can be intentional, it can be unintentional. Uh, another type of uh, adherence classification could be whether it's underuse, overuse or improper use. And as the first speaker, uh, Professor Bowen spoke about uh, COPD, where there could be overuse adherence is also a problem in case of uh, COPD and uh, improper use is also possible, but the most common type of non adherence is underuse, especially in uh, most chronic conditions like diabetes or hypertension, etc. So, there is usually some deviation from the prescribed frequency and the dosage. Uh, as uh, the previous speaker spoke about uh, health beliefs uh, moderating uh, adherence. Or, so we found that in India also there is, for instance, there is a lot of uh, traditional, uh, uh, long-standing traditional men, uh, medicine heritage. But uh, in that, there is often a concept of, say, a cold and hot, uh, some medicines which are uh, cold or hot. So usually these con due to these concepts, sometimes patients tend to interrupt their therapy or they feel that if they have taken their medication for a long time, then uh, probably it will lead to certain kind of adverse events. So uh, these kind of beliefs or erroneous beliefs can sometimes uh, result in underuse medication uh, adherence also. Yeah, so next slide. Uh, so the global burden, uh, we know now that nearly one in two people with chronic diseases are non-adherent globally, and there is significant variation with the disease condition and adherence rates are higher. In, uh, so what we observe, and this is specifically from the perspective of most Indian studies that I've observed, that adherence rates are significantly higher in clinic-based studies com compared to when you do community-based studies. And the main reason, again, is when I spoke initially, is that drug accessibility, because patients uh, who report to uh, uh, the uh, in a, cl uh, a clinic or patients who report to a health facility, they are more likely to be adherent in terms of some kind of medication intake compared to community-based studies where there will be patients who have probably never been initiated on uh, any kind of drug therapy, or even if they have been initiated, they have subsequently terminated their therapy. Uh, I hope I'm audible because I'm receiving some comments. Uh, so uh, drug accessibility and drug adherence, therefore, are different phenomena and which may overlap in these kind of resource limited settings. So uh, another phenomena which again overlaps medication adherence in low resource settings, uh, settings is the concept of clinical or therapeutic inertia. It may happen even in first world settings, but it is more likely in uh, resource limited LMIC settings. And this usually happens, uh, clinical inertia or therapeutic inertia is the failure to intensify the therapy despite the failure to achieve uh, the desired health outcomes. So a patient with, say, an HbA1c of persistent, uh, uh, persistently poor controlled uh, blood sugar levels, a high HbA1c level may be more than 8 or 8.5, but there is still no intensification, failure to switch to insulin. These factors are usually more common in resource-limited settings because, A, uh, there is 
challenge of access for certain patients and b there is there will also a problem that many of the patients can be uh, have very low educational attainments uh, their ed educational status can be poor some diagnose so often uh, clinicians are also concerned that whether uh, intensifying the therapy and uh, increased regimen complexity can actually undermine their effective adherence. So these challenges, unfortunately, overlap adherence in a way, access and both uh, clinical inertia that uh, they contribute to a more complex phenomena than standard, uh, which all ultimately result in uh, medication non-adherence. Next slide. So what are the consequences of medication non-adherence? Again, standardly, it results in suboptimal treatment benefit. There is worsening of therapeutic outcome. Uh, it aggravates disease with early onset of complications. There is increased frequency of hospital admissions and uh, tentative estimate costs that the economic costs run in billions of dollars. So uh, as per the World Health Organization, it is the top, one of the top 10 challenges and probably can be most rewarding if we can improve the medication adherence levels in the general population. Uh, but as I said, the, it's a multidimensional problem. And uh, some of, uh, so there are some aspects to medication adherence which go beyond uh, the behavior of the patients and also have to account for certain health system factors and also as the accessibility to medicine uh, becomes also particularly important when you are contextualizing adherence in low resource settings. Next slide. So this is another slide which I have. Uh, so this slide basically summates that uh, uh, there is a reference for it. Uh, I've forgotten to put it, but basically this summates that what are the reasons for non-adherence. Again, there has been a lot of discussion on that and by the first speaker. So broadly, it is about knowledge, skills, beliefs about capabilities, beliefs about consequences, uh, conflicts on goals, uh, motivation, sometimes carelessness, forgetfulness is another challenge, and social. Uh, social factors are a big factor in medication adherence, as we have observed in our local settings that uh, in family, when there is family support, for instance, in India, there are still a sizable proportion of population lives in joint families where the three generations live under the same roof. So social support is particularly important. So uh, I have seen that elderly patients, often those who have received support from, say, their daughter-in-laws, they have uh, uh, who remind them about their regularly about their medication intake. They have very good uh, medication adherence uh, compared to those who are living in nuclear families or who live alone or lack substantial uh, or when there is a social isolation. So these factors also play a uh, social factors also play a role. And if uh, so, uh, the social support mechanism, existing social support uh, mechanisms should be maximized to improve medication adherence uh, because they can tackle the problems like carelessness and forgetfulness. Uh, capabilities and execution are also particularly important where social support can play a, a role. For instance, administration of insulin uh, that can uh, social support, family support can play a role. And especially in these traditional settings where there is uh, potential social support available where people are still living in uh, larger families, uh, these uh, processes can also play a role. So when you have pharmacists or community health workers educating patients, simultaneously educating family members can also be rewarding. Uh, to just give another example, once we did a text, simple text message intervention, we sent SMS text-based mes remind, text reminders to patients uh, of diabetes. And we found that adherence as well as awareness, knowledge of diabetes improved significantly in those patients who may have had a relatively average uh, health literacy or an average health education, average uh, educational status also. But because of the support they received from their uh, family members, uh, they were able to improve their adherence levels. So while uh, these... Uh, from a uh, very puritanical point of view, it will say that in an RCT, it should be just a patient to provide a communication. But when you are focusing in a low resource setting, take into account that most of these interventions like technology, health technology based interventions, and as we know, younger people in the family will be more uh, technologically adept. 
uh, unless, uh, so they are digital natives after all. So at that time, these interventions can acquire the shape and form of a family-centered intervention. So uh, you could look. Uh, so when designing interventions to improve medication adherence, taking into account uh, the family support becomes crucial in these kind of traditional settings. Next slide. So uh, we conducted uh, a study to see that what kind, uh, which which RCTs, what is the evidence from RCTs or uh, the causal evidence to show on uh, which interventions actually improve medication adherence. So we restricted our uh, study to uh, all studies conducted in India and only two studies involving non-communicable diseases. We did not consider uh, chronic conditions like HIV or even tuberculosis which can often coexist with 10 CD uh, conditions. Because, so that was a limitation. And uh, actually most evidence for medication adherence strategies, they are based on the more economically developed countries and basically based on per capita income. And existing evidence from LMICs tends to consist of primary studies or those which focus on infectious diseases. So this was the rationale for conducting this study. It was published in Frontiers in Public Health, and uh, the link is there. So I'll just briefly describe what we found. Next slide. Uh, so this was the aim to review the evidence for interventions to promote medication adherence for chronic diseases in India and provide a qualitative synthesis of results from available RCTs, disaggregated by intervention and uh, chronic disease. Next slide. Uh, so this was our inclusion criteria that we included peer-reviewed primary articles in English. Most studies in India are written in the English language, so that was not a limitation. And we uh, restricted uh, subjects who were exposed to an intervention with the primary or secondary intended effect of increasing medication adherence. We included only RCT studies, so that excluded certain quasi-experimental single-group studies. Uh, and uh, sub subjects, all the participants were from India and they were exposed to an, uh, and they were located within the uh, community when taking uh, medication, although subjects could also be recruited from a hospital. So the target was uh, that to see that which interventions are more likely to be scalable and replicable. Uh, we excluded secondary data analysis, uh, those which were uh, not India specific data was inaccessible, those which focused on communicable diseases like HIV and tuberculosis and uh, non-RCT that I told were excluded. Next slide. So we used a comprehensive search strategy. We uh, used it on Medline, Web of Science, Scopus and Google Scholar and there were no restrictions uh, based on uh, publication or geographical region except for English language studies which were included. Next slide. Uh, so Based on the PICO format, we could see that population was patients located in India. Intervention was any intervention with the aim of increasing medication adherence. Comparison uh, were control subjects receiving usual standard of care. And our outcomes were medication adherence either assessed subjectively or through uh, like through a questionnaire or objective pill count and through changes in as associated clinical parameters like HbA1c for type 2 diabetes. Next, next slide. Uh, so this is the flow diagram and it shows that out of all the studies, uh, 1264 abstracts which were screened, we were ultimately left with only 22 RCTs after exclusion. And this methodology was informed by Prisma and we used the Cochrane Risk of Bias tool version 2. And we used a pre, uh, for data extraction a pre-specified template on Google Sheets was used. Next slide. So uh, briefly, just to summarize uh, this evidence, uh, 14 of, out of these 22 RCTs use both direct measures of adherence like questionnaires, self-reporting or pill counts and also, and also indirect measures like through change in clinically relevant parameters like systolic blood pressure, HbA1c, health-related quality of life as end outcomes. Four studies only use indirect measures through change in clinical relevant parameters. And only three studies use direct measures of subjective uh, adherence, while one study used both objective and subjectively directed measures of adherence. So at this point, uh, just to pause, uh, when we assess medication adherence, as I told you, it could be through questionnaires, pill counts, self-reports. But obviously, the self-reported measures 
tend to uh, have an overestimation due to the self -des social desirability bias of participants. And especially in these kind of R series where there is a follow up, there is likely overestimation when we are using only self reported measures. Uh, consequently, using indirect measures like HbA1c are uh, preferable uh, or using uh, something like a blood pressure if we are uh, doing it in hypertension pa patients. The challenge, however, is that lifestyle factors or other aspects or like diet and exercise also play a role in improving adherence. So uh, the effect of these interventions on those other aspects could not be completely measured. And so uh, even although most of the studies showed a benefit uh, in improvement of adherence, we were unable to, uh, it will be difficult for us to say that how much could be attributed to uh, the intervention alone because uh, diet and exercise especially for diabetes hypertension cardiovascular disease in those conditions diet and exercise also play a major role so uh, it was not and finally also about access because none of the studies provided any uh, information on whether there was any effort to improve access to medications to these patients now what usually happens is if these studies are conducted in if the patients are recruited from health facilities, uh, usually in the context of the study, the access to medication may improve because these patients can receive a, a standard uh, uh, access uh, to medication, which is somewhat dissimilar from the usual patients. So improved access can also translate into improved adherence. Uh, so uh, that is one factor, that is one potential risk of bias that was not factored by most of these studies. Next slide. So uh, this is broadly when I spoke about how to measure uh, adherence. Uh, these are some of the methods. But again, when we go to the uh, LMIC or low resource settings, there is a major challenge that some of these questionnaires that were designed, they are not particularly culturally uh, validated in Indian settings. Uh, second, as I told you that I'm, uh, some of them don't have any question to assess uh, financial non adherence or the inability to act, uh, avail medications uh, due, uh, due to a cost of medication or in a, a lack of health insurance or such factors. Because even in India, most health insurance, uh, especially private health insurance, does not cover for uh, routine out of pocket uh, expenses uh, for or routine uh, med med medicine access. Uh, government facilities provide medicines free of cost, but usually there are certain stock runouts which uh, sometimes happen. Uh, so these factors also play a role. Uh, prescription refill methods, when we measure the proportion of uh, days covered, uh, or based, which are based on secondary databases, the problem simply is that uh, most of the information, in uh, at least in our settings, are not digitized. So because of the lack of digitization, we don't have information based on secondary database. So there is, but it's uh, it's somewhat limited compared to first world settings. So you will not have information, immediate information on what was the proportion of days covered or uh, so uh, those challenges are there. Uh, electronic counters, of course, are coming in a way, but they are still very limited. Uh, so that is also not feasible. Uh, pill verification by text message, it was initially used in a, uh, in this 99 dots is actually a method that was used in the uh, TV program in India, considering India the highest TV burden. And this was supported by Microsoft. This uh, So this pill verification by text message involved where when the person takes a pill, they, they there is a specific code and it has to be texted to a and it, it could be used, texted without an internet. It could be texted through short message service in a toll, to a toll-free number. So that was another method of verification that was that is being used actually in the uh, TB program. Next slide. So uh, broadly, if I discuss that, uh, what were the approaches which succeeded? So every all the almost out of these twenty two studies, almost all uh, most of the studies showed some improvement in the uh, medication adherence levels. Uh, but these most of these studies were of very short duration. They were on average these studies were of three to six months duration. So we cannot uh, imply that what because adherence is a dynamic phenomena. We cannot uh, imply from these studies that the benefits would. Uh, 
extend for years or say for uh, several months or years. Uh, and there is a possibility that some of these interventions uh, may taper off once the novelty of the intervention wears off, probably it would not work that. Reminder-based solutions were most effective when accompanied with patient education. So when we saw that what were the modalities of patient education, there were two modalities. Either it was through community health workers. So we have a very large network of uh, uh, community health workers. Uh, they can have uh, they can even be non-formal health workers like the accredited social. They can be health volunteers like accredited social health activists who are usually women. And uh, there can also be certain community, uh, certain nursing practitioners, and also as well as there were certain uh, chemist or pharmacist uh, driven interventions also. Uh, most of these pharmacist driven interventions that you involved a single counseling and they were not multi repeated counseling like some of the more advanced uh, pharmacists, like in the first presentation we saw. So there is a lot of scope for improving uh, adherence through uh, uh, chemists. Also, we have a large network of private chemists and these private chemists are actually in India. Uh, medicines are uh, quite easily available uh, out of pocket through uh, through private chemists, often even without a prescription. So because the, these challenges exist, uh, so it is important that whenever you think of pharmacist driven intervention in the Indian context, it is not just public sector pharmacists, but also those in the private sector who have to be roped in if we want to improve adherence. For instance, a potential intervention could be if we could sensitize pharmacists to provide uh, adherence related messages to the their uh, their customers. Uh, we have seen, for instance, not in this, another of our my studies actually was focused on uh, pharmacist driven interventions in, TB, in, in patients with tuberculosis. And in there, we found that the defaulter rate or the loss to follow up actually reduced when patients who were uh, buying medicines from the uh, buying anti tuberculosis medication from private pharmacies, if when we sensitize the pharmacist to provide a leaflet as well as certain count as and certain motivational messages, the actual uh, there was a reduction in the uh, rate of uh, uh, loss to follow up among patients with tuberculosis and there was greater completion of treatment. So there is a, these are uh, some crucial resources that can be exploited, that can be utilized for improving medication adherence. Uh, fixed dose combination tablets work and they are particularly cost effective. So our TV program is already used, has gone to uh, daily uh, fixed dose combinations. But for diabetes and for hypertension, we are still in the public sector is still lacking too many fixed dose combinations. So that is something that can be considered uh, subject to cost effectiveness. Uh, Psychology based techniques, we did not find them to be, uh, uh, they were not, uh, they are not amenable to cost effectiveness and scalability and utility may be further compromised. So whenever we are looking at inter these kind of interventions, we have to think of what is scalable and replicable and uh, pharmacist driven interventions, even in public sector have some scalability, replicability, but the motivation has to be there because most of the time, this is my personal uh, observation that most of the time the focus of the pharmacist is just on dispensing the medicine and not so much and once a day twice a day motivational messages to adhere to not stop the treatment to report on time to take the refills those uh, require more sensitization and effort because uh, there is a lot of high patient load in the public set uh, public settings so most of the time the uh, pharmacists are not intuitively uh, interested in, uh, in uh, you know providing uh, messages to improve adherence so that sensitization uh, has to be there and which can translate into real world improvements in medication adherence in the general population next slide so uh, as i said there is a moderate and higher uh, risk of bias in the studies which i observed and mostly with RCTs, there was a lack of information on how uh, randomization occurred. So whenever designing interventions in this, these settings, randomization to improve the validity of this uh, studies and to improve their robustness and reliability, the randomization has to be reported. So reporting of randomization has to be strengthened. And uh, pre-registration of RCTs, uh, protocols has to be there, but unfortunately, uh, most of it is only open access journals uh, have these uh, protocols. So I think uh, that is a more uh, problem. The, the greater problem is most of the people who are doing these studies don't have 
adequate funds to publish uh, their protocols online. So these factors also need to be considered that why we don't, uh, why this pre-registration uh, of protocols or pre-publication of protocols is not happening. And it was true for most of these cases. Next slide. Uh, so uh, as I said, this is a, basically a summary. I've already spoken about it. So methodology is somewhat weak. The time frame is short. Uh, there is a heterogeneous use of uh, measures. And uh, because the number of studies is relatively small for a large country and because of the heterogeneity in the public health systems in India across the large number, almost 30 states, we cannot give geographic breakdown on what works and what doesn't. And uh, contextualizing healthcare systems also was not possible in this review. Next slide. So in uh, conclusion, RCTs in India uh, e examining strategies to enhance medication adherence in community-based patients with NCDs. Uh, majority of RCTs use subjective measures of adherence uh, while using uh, objective equivalent clinical indicators. But the scalability of these interventions, the inclusion of these interventions into the larger health initiated requires comprehensive evaluation of their real world efficacy and effectiveness. And especially when patients come from low income settings, those living in remote settings, uh, then it becomes particularly challenging. Patient education by community health workers and chemists represents a viable strategy to enhance medication adherence. So, next slide. So thank you for uh, uh, listening to me and I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you very much, Dad, Dr. Basu, for a, a very comprehensive uh, presentation, especially uh, presenting your um, qualitative synthesis of um, RCT, RCT data in such a robust, um, robust manner. Um, now it's my very great pleasure to introduce our fourth and final speaker. Uh, for this evening, uh, Dr. Chai Siri Ankura Weronon from uh, has an MD from Chiang Mai University in Thailand, and he specialises in family medicine. He's also received his uh, medical statistics master's degree and PhD in NCDs and epidemiology from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. His research focuses on global health issues related to aging and chronic conditions in primary care. Now, Dr. Chai Series is assistant professor at the Department of Family Medicine, Faculty of Medicine at Chiang Mai University in Thailand. Uh, please, sir, welcome to the uh, virtual podium. We're really looking forward to your presentation today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Shen, for the nice presentation, for the organizers for inviting me, and for all the people still listening in. Um, I will be very brief because a lot of the presentations and the points has been covered by previous speakers. So I'll only highlight uh, what I think would add on. So I think my presentation today will bring a little bit more of a patient's perspective uh, towards medication adherence. So we've heard about what factors are related, um, what type of interventions that we can do, but not so much what the patient thinks and what the patient thinks we can do. So I'm going to add just that aspect to the presentation today, a little bit of the Thai context, but I know a lot of Thai delegates are here, but obviously we have over 53,000 people in adults in Thailand and prevalence of diabetes about 10%. And the overall control among those who are in treatment is around 30%. So we, we, we are hovering around 30%. Um, so in terms of trying to understand patients' perceptions or illness or attitudes towards the disease, uh, we conducted a study uh, using a brief illness perception questionnaire. This is a questionnaire commonly used in the literature. We adapted it for diabetes. Um, it, it asked the patients their perceptions or their the concerns basically towards eight different types of domains. These are domains of consequences. Uh, so how, how concerned are they that diabetes will affect their life? Uh, concerns regarding timelines. So you know, how concerned are you that diabetes will continue uh, you know, for a long time where you have diabetes as a chronic condition now? Uh, how concerned are you? Do you have uh, feeling you have control over your diabetes? You're confident that treatment can help your diabetes? Um, how much uh, concern you have over symptoms of diabetes, for example. 
how much you understand diabetes and how does diabetes affect you emotionally. So basically what we did was we took about uh, 600 new patients diagnosed with diabetes and you can see the reference in our slides, but at least among Thai patients, I will summarize the top five domains. Uh, basically patients are very concerned about once being diagnosed with diabetes, the chronic nature of it. So I think from a, a family medicine point of view is being labeled with the chronic disease that's gonna be with them for a long time. Uh, they are concerned, very concerned about how diabetes is affecting their daily life and daily living. They also feel that they actually do not have personal control of diabetes, which could be a point quite related to uh, medical adherence. Sometimes uh, they may be forced to do, you know, exercise, physical activities, uh, taking medication, things like that. And they feel that they may not actually have control. There are issues, with symptoms of diabetes. And, uh, and another one is the fear of treatment itself. So at least some patients in Thailand actually is concerned about the treatment, which is about the medication that they're giving. And again, in our study, we all of these domains are associated. If you took the summation of the domains, um, it would, you know, it would say that people who are more concerned are more likely to have poor control. Yeah? And especially in the personal control domains. Now, to put that in more. So that's the quantitative, so that's one study. We actually did another study using, again, uh, Dr. Rhee's framework that she mentioned from the WHO as well. So we actually asked, now we actually went to do a qualitative study. So we asked patients about factors that may be related to their medical adherence about their diabetes. So we asked, you know, how do you feel about diabetes? Um, how, you know, how does this affect your medication? Um, when did you have hypertension? Did that relate to why you decided to take medication? We also asked, you know, how can healthcare providers help improve adherence? So I think that's a very specific question, very related to uh, our session today. So again, there's a reference to our study conducted in Thailand. Um, so I, I will quickly summarize, um, at least from the Thai patients, that uh, there are many things according to individuals, five domains that affect adherence among Thai patients. And among Thai patients, they express one is severity of symptoms. Uh, among those who do not have severity of symptoms, that diagnosis, as you may, you may imagine, um, they're not very adhered to treatment. Um, those who, who have severe symptoms at diagnosis, who know and understand the causation and, and a progression of diabetes tend to have a, a more adherence. But again, you have to be careful because the second aspect we learn is there are also people who actually, they want to be diagnosed. They under, sort of understand the treatment. But I think similar to the speaker from India that mentioned that they're concerned about the side effects and also the preference to alternative therapy as well in Thailand, so herbal therapy. Um, again, they are very concerned that taking medication will cause renal failure, for example. Um, some feel that they are taking too many medication. So sometimes I would ask my students, instead of asking about adherence, ask them how they feel about taking the medication. How many medication are you taking for? Do you feel that's quite a bit? Is that challenging for you? So I mean, and once you hear people are answering, I'm taking a lot of medication, you just can check the adherence. I think that's also one cue that may help. So more specific to the role of family members and adherence, I think especially in developing countries such as Thailand, India, family members have a key role. So again, you can prescribe all the medication you want. You can explain everything they want, but in older patients, they may have trouble remembering, splitting pills, finding medication, and even coming to hospitals for follow-ups and checks. So our patients also express these ideas. And finally, I think uh, very relevant to our group today is how can the healthcare team help with adherence? So, I think it's key to highlight none of the patients say that they want more information. <laughs> um, what they did express was they felt that if they perceived compassion and understanding from the provider, that encourages trust. And then with that trust, they are more willing to adhere. So, so, so I think from, from all the talks today, whatever interventions we have, I think the concept of patient-centered care, uh, patient-centered communication should be the underlying thoughts in our mind when we are trying to implement any interventions to increase adherence. 
Uh, so I, like I said, I will make up for the time and go very quickly. So, so, so just to summarize, um, again, uh, patients' concern and feelings do affect adherence and diabetes control. Uh, in the Thai context, I, I hope, I also think quite similar to probably other country. It's, it's the chronic nature that's a concern for them, the consequences, along with the fear, um, and also the effectiveness of treatment itself. So if we don't ask, we won't know. Yeah? So I think that's something to explore. Um, of course, promoting medication is, is encouragement about self-control. You need to support family members and providers. And lastly, um, trust with providers, I think, would be the key to help any type of intervention towards uh, medical adherence. Uh, so with that, um, I thank you all very much and happy to take questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Chaisiri, for a um, excellent presentation, and especially for uh, bringing us back to a patient-centered or a person-centered approach through the uh, through the measurement of um, medication adherence using the brief illness perceptions questionnaire and other measures. Um, there's been quite a lot of uh, discussion online in the Q and A uh, chat. Uh, please, can I encourage all of the um, uh, delegates online to put their questions and comments in the Q&A chat. Many of the questions I note have already been, um, uh, been uh, answered. And I thank you to the panelists who've already provided their uh, written responses there. Um, now there is an opportunity to um, bring your other questions to the Q&A um, um, chat. Um, can we go to the... Um, just bring the panelists back online, please, Ines. So I'm sure everyone would agree um, that we've had a fascinating series of uh, presentations today, uh, covering a broad range of activities to do with mitigation management and uh, the measurement of uh, medication um, adherence. Quite a lot of the uh, questions have already been answered in the Q&A chat function um, online. But um, um, one, of the, one of the questions here, and maybe this uh, question goes to you, uh, Job, our first speaker um, this evening. Um, digital technology um, and assistance of medication adherence is that a feasible approach? What's your view on this, please? Yeah, that, that's a very good question, Professor Jen. Um, in research, it seems like very promising novel devices, and it can some of them can give both direct patient feedback. However, currently, some may be too expensive to be applied in, in current practice, and especially maybe in low resource settings. However, there are clear differences, I think, and some apps can be very cheap and still supporting the patient being built on the local level. So, and in other settings or in all settings, I, I think it's important that these digital devices are reimbursed um, and will be accepted by patients and healthcare professionals, uh, making sure they are also um, fit for, for example, patients with low health literacy. So these are some considerations we need to uh, to have for them. And thank you very much. That really is very interesting and a, and a, and a significant opportunity uh, for the future. Um, one of the other questions which has come directly uh, through to me, uh, this is addressed to Dr. Nakajima, and it's in relation to your cross-sectional study. You talked about, um, you know, we generally think about low adherence rates in mm -hmm. elderly people, but I think your study showed uh, that younger people have uh, lower medication adherence rates. Do you care to explain that a little bit further to us, please? Thank you, Dr. Chen. Uh, actually, this point is one of the important strengths of our study. Um, we conduct online survey which allowed inclusion of patients who did not visit or stopped visiting hospital, clinic or pharmacies. So compared to uh, health facility-based surveys, uh, they do not include this category of patients. So in other words, our study includes patients who reacted to treatment. Therefore, 
uh, we think it's possible that the result may reflect their actual conditions. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, a very insightful answer. Uh, um, Dr. Nakajima, I have another question, and this is going to uh, Professor Chai Siri. I mean, you talk about having a patient-centered approach and measurement of uh, patient-reported adherence measures. How do we sort of connect these to the more quantitative measures of medication adherence? Do they give us different information, or um, uh, do they give us similar information to the uh, standard quantitative measures of medication adherence. Like if there's a discrepancy, how do we deal with that? So I think that's a very good point. Um, these measures of perceptions and concerns uh, do not always directly uh, associate with adherence, but it does associate a lot with self-management in general. So for example, in diabetes, it does correlate with um, self-testing, uh, um, foot examination, medication adherence. So I think in different populations, um, how it affects diabetes will be different. It may not directly infer to adherence, but in our qualitative study, that was our focus on, like how would these concerns focus? Um, I think more broadly uh, for NCDs and chronic disease, I think these concerns are mediated by self-management because people are living and having to manage a lot of their conditions at home, eating physical activity, exercise. So I think examining these concerns and examining their self-care behavior is actually the key. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Also providing very important insights, taking a patient-centered approach and really triangulating the um, different data that we can access in terms of medication adherence. Um, if Dr. Basu is um, still available online, yeah. Um, there, there's a question which has also come through to me, and this is in relation to access to medicines in low middle income countries. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you see in the literature the notion of primary non-adherence and secondary non-adherence relating to access to um, medicines. Do you think or have you seen this as a um, issue in uh, your LMIC setting in India? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. As I just to collaborate, yeah. The if uh, this type of it, uh, adherence where the lack of access uh, makes it a challenge to uh, get a, uh, makes uh, makes is a reason for non-adherence. And often in one of my studies previously in diabetes patients, also I observed that uh, running out of uh, drug pills was a re uh, attributed as a reason for non-adherence. But most of these ad adherence studies are cross-sectional and you are, the recall period is usually how much around 15 days for uh, MS, which is the gold standard. We take a recall period of 15 days. So if you do just a cross-sectional study and assess adherence for the past 15 days, it may be quite okay. But if there is some supply side interruption, uh, like a stock out which happens in a in any type of facility and the patient is unable to say purchase out of pocket for some time uh, this would result in uh, uh, a suboptimal adherence maybe just preceding the period of inquiry or sometime afterwards so the best way to assess this adherence in these settings would be to assess adherence over multiple time points instead of uh, prospectively instead of taking uh, just a uh, recall for seven to 14 days. So those kind of measures have uh, their inherent challenges. And there is usually an, uh, the, uh, uh, the rate of adherence, which is estimated through uh, conventional uh, modalities, it is usually an overestimation and actual adherence rates would be even lower. So coming back to the point on primary and secondary, yes, uh, if we consider access related issues have to be incorporated in the context of LMIC settings. And uh, although or not all LMIC settings are similar, similar within India also, there's a lot of heterogeneity. Some settings have very robust uh, flow of medicines, but there are certain challenges elsewhere. Sometimes there are multiple medications. So one of the, especially with multimorbidity and multiple long-term conditions. So if you have four conditions and medicine is available for say three of those conditions, but not for the fourth condition, how do you assess adherence then do you assess adherence for each of these conditions individually which takes a lot of time and research wise also i was just doing one study where we found that 
actually uh, adherence is only most of the studies like if they're assessing adherence for patients with diabetes they're only doing it for di uh, diabetes they're not doing it for a uh, common comorbidities or multimorbid conditions like hypertension cholesterol etc so we don't get the real picture of the impact of non adherence on uh, the overall uh, overall health of the patients so uh, this is a complex uh, problem and uh, uh, although and deceptively simple so uh, when we go into adherence, always uh, we have to uh, check into account whether the access to medication is available or not. That's the first thing. Before adherence is access, in my opinion. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, providing those important insights. Um, we're almost at um, almost at uh, time now. So I know we haven't come to all of the um, questions online, but I think we've had a very good go at addressing the vast majority of questions online. So I'd like to uh, wrap up and make some uh, concluding comments. We've had an excellent series of presentations uh, today uh, from international experts from across the globe. We've talked about quantitative measures. Uh, we've talked about uh, patient reported measures. We've talked about various conceptual frameworks in relation to uh, medication adherence. And these are all very important for us to consider as uh, pharmacists and pharmaceutical scientists in our um, in our day-to-day uh, -day, uh, care. Importantly, we've also had good discussion about uh, the differences of um, consideration of medication adherence in low middle income countries as well. I do want to again, thank all of our expert speakers for their red uh, contribution to the uh, webinar today. I thank all of the participants online for their excellent comments and questions uh, throughout this uh, particular uh, uh, webinar. Um, can we go to the next slide, please, Ines? Um, if we revisit the poll questions that we um, gave at the very beginning of this uh, webinar, um, please answer the poll question number one on your screens, please. What percentage of patients estimated to be non-adherent to chronic medications uh, by the WHO. I think most people suggested 50% in the pre-presentation discussion of this particular multiple choice question. And can we go to the answers now, please? Or the responses now, please, Ines? Yes, so we see most people also choosing around 50% with this question, which is um, correct. Let's go to the next question, please, Ines. So here is the uh, next question, and can you put the poll option up, please? Which of the following causes unintentional non-adherence? Can we go to the poll question, please? So which of the following causes unintentional non-adherence? If we can have the poll question up, that would be excellent. If not, let's go to the next slide, please. And the third question is the WHO framework, which is the fifth factor in relation to medication adherence. And can we have the poll function, please, if this is available? I think most people chose socioeconomic factors, item, item C. Um, let's go to the very next slide, please. Thank you. Um, a recording of this event will be made available here at events.fip.org. Next slide, please. And I hope to see many of you at the FIP conference in Brisbane, um, 24th to the 28th of September. If not in person at the FIP Congress in uh, Brisbane, perhaps at another webinar event organised by uh, the uh, FIP. Once again, thank you very much to Viatris and FIP for organising this webinar. And of course, to our excellent speakers, and uh, for the very good participation of participants online. Thank you very much and good evening. Bye-bye.